Okay, so we're excited to have Chaudi Wu visit us this week. Chaudi is currently an assistant professor at the University of Oregon, but he'll move uh, later this year to Quicks, where he accepted a new position in the computer science department. Um, Chaudi works on an impressive range of stuff, quantum algorithms, query complexity, um, um, even programming languages. He also works on, on that. He had a purple, purple paper last year. Um, Chaudi got his PhD from Michigan in 2013. Many of you might know uh, Yao Yun Chi, his advisor. Uh, he was a postdoc at MIT and a Simons Research Fellow. And you got the floor, Chaudi. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, it's uh, also interesting uh, just watching the setup in Microsoft using Windows. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I, uh, yeah, this is actually the first time I uh, put my affiliation change to the public. So I'm moving to University of Maryland in June. So it happened less than two months. So, um, so actually, I, I think uh, Martin uh, said I have done a lot of sense, but actually I haven't done really a lot in quantum algorithms. So this is the the first type of you know kind of job that I'm trying to do something in quantum algorithm. And so my title is uh, Quantum Query Complexity of Entropy Estimation. And uh, I'll explain that you know, if you don't feel that each word makes sense to you, but hopefully some will make sense to you. But uh, you know, first of all, I want you just uh, to tell you a little bit why do I come across this problem. Uh, of course, if you just search for entropy estimation, you see a lot of papers, and you see motivation uh, from you know, various dis you know, perspectives. So it's an interesting problem on its own right. So fair enough. But uh, so my motivation to, you know, to find this problem in the first place is that I want you uh, you know, find you know, quantum advantage in any type of algorithm. So this is uh, the very, very first motivation. And of course, then you see there, there are a lot of ranges of uh, potential algorithms in the classical literature. So this is really about property testing. So we have started uh, you know, property testing in classical literature, especially nowadays for like big data. You know, people want to see, can we use a sublinear time algorithm to test the property of uh, you know, huge uh, data? Or maybe the data could be a distribution, something like that. And uh, we try to you know, think about using quantum tester, but you know, still testing classical properties. You can use a quantum tester to test a quantum property. So a very uh, you know, important example will be the quantum tomography. You just uh, test the state. And as I said, this is a, a you know, sub-branch of uh, property testing where you test of distributional properties. It's not a, about a function. It's a, just about distribution, what kind of dis you know, property the distribution has. It's a well-motivated branch in the classical property literary, uh, testing literature. Uh, you know, I'll show you more uh, application in just uh, in, in a moment. And I, uh, you know, a particular reason I'm interested in the distribution is because it's not a Boolean functions. So we have seen a lot of things in starting Boolean function, and you probably see work about a quantum uh, you know, advantage for some you know, learning or maybe uh, testing of Boolean functions. There you have a very, uh, you know, I think it's a closer connection to what we have learning in quantum query capacity. But this one is about distributions. So in the hope is that it might bring new insights or call for new techniques. And that's why you know, I choose to use this one. That's my start point. OK, so what's the problem? So I hope everyone here is just familiar with entropy definition. So but just, I put this anyway. Uh, it, you have a given distribution, and you can define the channel entropy to be HP to be the minus PIX log PIX. It carries uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, is a very essential definition. It carries a lot of meaning information theory, first promoted by Shannon, and that's why it's called Shannon entropy. And you can also have a generalization of Shannon entropy, which is called a Rennie entropy, where instead of, uh, uh, you know, having this particular formula, you, you generate to, to be any alpha. So alpha can be any real number, I mean, any positive real number. And the definition will be, uh, if it's not a one, you just define to be the you know summation of a px to the alpha, and take log one and then times one over one uh, minus alpha. If you take the uh, limit you know to the case when alpha is one, it, it co you know collides with the definition of a Shannon entropy. And you uh, you know usually the Rennie entropy is uh, something you know uh, has I think it's more analytical and uh, easy to work with, easy to test and good, give you a good approximation of HP. And of course, there are you know, certain uh, uh, 
different, uh, you know, for different R part, they have a, you know, different other uh, motivation to study this kind of running entropy as well. Oh, just one, one thing. If you have any questions, just feel free to interact with me. I, my slides is not long, so <laughs> we should have enough time. OK, so, so what's the problem? So let's assume uh, your distribution is supported on the size n domain. And the question is that I, if I have uh, some, you know, I can get some samples that, you know, taken independently draw from this distribution, I want to estimate about like either Shannon entropy or Rennie entropy within some, you know, error margin with high probability. So that's, that's the, the problem. So you're given independent sample from distribution. You want to uh, estimate this entropy. So um, as I said, this has a lot of motivation for people to study this kind of question. Uh, I won't enumerate them, but you can find literature in statistic, information theory, learning theory, even algorithm design. So why algorithm design is, uh, you know, can be here is because, so maybe you're, you're you know, uh, in the intermediate step of your algorithm, you are outputting some distribution. And the entropy may be just the uh, sum, you know, uh, you know, quantity you can use to uh, tell you or distinguish between two different cases. And you want to have a good, good estimation of that. Okay. Now, our question is, of course, as I said, we want to find whether there's any quantum speed up of estimation of channel and running entropies. So that's the main question. As I say again, so this motivation is from, you know, we have already started some quantum property testing. Now we want to start the quantum testers for classical uh, property, and this is for classical distribution property. So the first uh, literature on this topic is by Bravi, uh, Harrow, and uh, Hasidim. That's a paper in 2011. So they discovered a, a quantum speed up for three very fundamental tasks for, you know, in distribution and proper testing. One is called uniform testing. Basically, say if I have a distribution where it's close to uniform distribution. And uh, orthogonality, just say, basically, you, you do get a support of two distribution where they're orthogonal or not. And a statistical difference, basically, you want to tell the difference between two distributions. So you have the, you know, get a sample from two different distributions. And that's the three tests there, you know, they are telecom, they haven't really worked work on the entropies. So that's, uh, you know, where we're coming. How, how big can that speed up be? Or how, typically, how big is the speed up? Uh, I, mean, I mean, this always is a uh, polynomial speed up. So, uh, okay, all right. so the question is that uh, what will be the quantum speed up, you know, how large it is? So it will be just a polynomial. And I think uh, for those three problems, just quadratic, yeah. Yeah. Uh, isn't there a statistical difference in the uniformity? Yeah, yeah. It's a more general case. This is a, just a simple one. Yeah, you're right. Yes? So, um, is there anything not obvious about uh, uh, classical estimates for these two entropies? You mean the, uh, the. If I have a sample, I can generate an estimate in, the, in a pretty straightforward way, right? You mean estimate of these? Several samples. I yeah. Can, I can average out. Yeah. Average the estimate out, and is, is there is there anything else that, that that's a good question? Know about about the classical procedure. Also, what classical procedure they compare to? Uh, I uh, show a table for for that. But that's a good question. I just repeat the question. So so what you can do classically, other than you know, intuitively have a you know sample from distribution. You might say just uh, numerically. I'm uh, sorry, uh, empirically, just uh, mm -hmm. look into what you, did, you know the frequency. So the frequency and guess what's the probability and uh, you know calculate the function in d depending on that probability. You can do that, but that's not the best way. I mean, even the classical sitting. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the classically, I mean, I actually I put this uh, after my thank you slides, but I probably will go there since you have this question. So there are many issues just using the empirical uh, estimator. People call this as empirical estimator. So one reason is that uh, you can think. Uh, Maybe for some property, I don't need to get like a full information of every PI, you know, the full distribution. So I can save a lot by just uh, using clever way uh, of uh, getting the information, not getting every PI. So that's one possibility. So the other possibility is uh, is there, you know something wrong with the the empirical uh, estimator itself. Um, the reason is that when you have an empirical, you say expectation is the right thing. But it's, uh, when you calculate, like uh, maybe, you know, because this is like an algorithm, sampling algorithm, you want to say, you know, 
uh, how, after how many uh, repetition I can get in the, the good uh, you know concentration. Then, but uh, you don't have good independence for each pi. So if you just think about what you get empirically, I mean the total sum of those uh, frequency will be the you know total number of your samples. If you only have two in you know, possibility, if you have one fixed for p p one, then the other is also fixed. They're not independent. So if you directly use the uh, empirical estimator, then you run into trouble because they're not independent. Then when you analyze the concentration, then there's correlation between different parts. So it's not that you know, good because of this. And there's a way to fix that in you know, a classical world. But uh, I don't see whether I have time to talk, really talk about that. It's not that directly relevant to the quantum approach we take, but we'll see. These guys are compared to, uh, comparing to the state of the art in. Yes, state of the art classical world, yes. Okay, more questions? <coughs> so, uh, what do we have down? So, before just talking about what we have down, so what's the state of our art classical results? And here's the table. So, let's assume your uh, error, I mean, the error margin is constant. So just for simplicity, otherwise I, I need to write a lot of error dependence. <laughs> I mean, you'll find that in my paper, but probably not here. So if you want to estimate channel entropy, so the best you can get is n over log n. It might be a little bit strange why you have an over log n. I mean, you can imagine this might be n. But this is a actually very complicated uh, <laughs> result to, to see why you have log n. I, I probably don't have time to explain that, but this is the work is, uh, you know, Start uh, first down by a valiant brothers like the the George Valley and the Paul Valley. So I think George Valley has a one ACM dissertation for just doing all this kind of stuff. Um, and if you're interested, is you just the number of samples. You Say again. Is that the number? Yeah, of the number of samples. samples. Yeah. And uh, for the uh, the Rennie entropy, this is the best you can get. So I think this is this year soda. And uh, you see again. Uh, for different range, you have different, uh, you know, result. Uh, so if it's between zero and one, you see this is a, it always, you know, there's a gap between the upper bound and this is the lower bound. It's not that huge gap. Just think about it. So this is a, oh, oh, and have a lock in, but this is like small one, a small of one. It's not a huge gap, but for any alpha bigger than one is an integer, then you have a, a full, you know, complete characterization. That's n to the one. Uh, minus one of alpha, and for any non-integers, uh, you know, alpha, then uh, the star is, uh, you know, again become complicated. What's the epsilon dependence? Uh, it's, uh, I mean, what's the epsilon dependence? So usually it will be like uh, poly one of epsilon something, it's just an additional factor. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a summary of uh, what we have done so far. Um, so I, I, the thing I, I, I didn't mention that this is still ongoing work. So, I have, so maybe the picture will change if you ask me in a month. Actually, the picture is not like this if you ask me, you know, two weeks ago. So I'm just telling you <laughs> what you know my current stat is. So it's keep evolving. Um, so basically, I mean, this I uh, I a list a table to show in a different interval for those alphas, and this is what we get as our result, and there's. Two particular line I want to have you look at this moment, and uh, I then have a picture. Then you can maybe uh, it's, it's easier to see the picture rather than look at this. So w the first line is when alpha is one, that's the channel entropy. So what you get classically is a big theta n over log n. You can have a quadratic speed up using the, you know the quantum method with square root of n, but we only manage to show uh, you know into the one third uh, as a lower bound. So there's still a gap between upper bound and lower bound. And when alpha is two, so that's you know sometimes called a collision entropy or, or you know running two entropy. So classically you have a complete characterization that's a square root of n. So what we can show is uh, into the one third and this is a you know tight bound. We have a matching lower bound. Okay. And what's uh, about the other possible you know range of alpha? Here's a picture. So just let me explain. So this, uh, uh, the, mag the magneta or the uh, purple line is the, uh, the, what we can show as the quantum lower bound. So this green line is the classical bound. Uh, you know, for most cases, they, it is tight. So we just consider this as a tight classical bound. 
So the, the red line and the dots are our, on the upper bounds. So uh, for the range, you know, for alpha between one half and the two, so we have always have some quantum advantage like this. It's it's not always quadratic. You see here is the you know the quadratic speed up, but not like you know in other ranges. And for you know any alpha bigger than two but not integer, we don't have any uh, result at the moment. Or you can I mean I talk more about that, but. The situation that we do have a result, but it's even worse than classical ones. So there's uh, no need to mention that. And then when alpha is an uh, integer, so classically <laughs> you see this the picture is uh, a bit you know strange. You don't have like a continuous uh, complexity for you know, con con you know for alpha, but when alpha is an integer, it can do significantly better classically. There are uh, like green dots, and we can do uh, even better. We have the the red dots. So. So that's the current picture. Any questions so far? Oh, when you say uh, that, that uh, you, you cannot show quantum advantage right, uh, for alpha greater or equal than 2 and non-integer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you mean to say that you, you don't have specific methods? Because the lower bound seems to be better. Yeah, the lower bound is better. It could be because we, we, we cannot prove yeah, better lower bound. Saturate the lower bound. No, we, we don't have any. We actually. We, what we have is uh, if you continue using our algorithm, you will have some line you know, higher than the green line. Of course, you can say, then I just use a classical method. Then you can use the classical upper bounds as a quantum upper bound, but that's not interesting. And for the, the purple line, it, yes, uh, that's the lower bound we have. And it could be because we, we didn't uh, you know, get a very good lower bound. And we, we, we don't have any idea because you see there's a huge gap between what you can do classically and what you can uh, show in S lower bound for quantum. And but this you know the story is complicated for non-integer alpha. So, so probably something like I can come back later. I don't want to you know complicate things at the moment. Okay, more questions? Okay, so so the techniques. So what we use uh, to show uh, uh, this result. So there's a force, uh, you know, the first thing is, uh, I, I want to clarify, actually we do have a different type of a setup, uh, you know, for the standards, you know, the model you're talking about in the classical literature and what you're going to use in the quantum. But I explained this is a, might be a reasonable setup and, you know, comparable <laughs> setup. So what's the, uh, the difference between the setup? So what I'll call this like a sample model or the query model. Um, so in, this is actually the model proposed by the uh, Bravi, uh, Heron, uh, and the Has Hasdim uh, paper, because they are the first one. So the motivation behind, and before I really uh, you know, define it, I just want to say what's the motivation. So think about you know, uh, the classical model says you have uh, independent draws from some uh, you know, distribution. So all you see will be just all the classical you know, distributions alone. And if you want to say we want to have some quantum advantage, you always think about you know, we can do like a superposition or maybe a, you know, coherent you know, sampling in that sense. Now if you, only, you can only draw independently from like a classical distribution, that just will destroy this possibility. Now we want to you know, find something that can allow you to have a coherent you know, you know, uh, you know, coherent query or, or sample from the distribution. So you get information in a coherent way. And this is one particular proposal. So what is this proposal? So instead of, uh, say, you get a, the distribution by, uh, you know, sample, uh, you know, classical, uh, you know, bits from the, the, uh, some distribution, you think you get access to the distribution by uh, Oracle. So this article says you have in parts of a very, very large, you know, uh, the domain. So better you map to n. So n is the support of a distribution. So how can you, uh, you know, define this article? So it's, this it by itself is just a function. It's mapped from a very large domain to your, uh, your support. And the probability for each pi, uh, you know, uh, is proportional to the size of the pre-image of this particular i under this, uh, you know, Oracle function. And I divide by you know this total amount or you know, possible or the size of your domain. So the pi will be just count the pre-image of i and over s. And you see this is a you know well-defined distribution. It's not 
but if you define this way, first you say, I mean, this is at least should be a rational number. It cannot be a rational numbers, right? But uh, we, uh, you know, kind of ignore that, you know, uh, you know uh, the difference and for now because maybe for real applications you all have a rational number to deal with. You don't have a rational number to deal with, and um, so this is a. Uh, the, this proposal, instead of having the uh, the sample, you have this uh, oracle to have you know to get information from distribution. So one simple thing you can see from this definition is that if I just sample uniformly from the the, the domain and output the uh, the the all you know the oracle apply onto the the sample S, so you can recover what you know the the normal like a sampling uh, model. You can get a sample from this uh, support N. So this direction is easy. And it turns out they can show, at least in a classical setting, the reverse is also true. So if you can have a, a, you know, a good, you know, good you know, probably testing algorithm using this oracle, and then you can manage to find a way just using the normal you know, sample model to achieve almost the same, uh, you know, same you know, query complexity. So, so this is uh, the non-trivial direction. In the classical world, and the intuition behind why this is true is because uh, you, if you just imagine, you know, what advantage I can get by having this, um, you know, query model rather than the sample model, is because you, you see, I probably can use the the structure of this Oracle function, and they, they show something like you cannot really make use of uh, the Oracle, you know, the structure of the Oracle function. So the intuition behind it is that if I do any permutation over this S, it defines a different Oracle function, but it gives you the same distribution. So your algorithm making use of this Oracle function should output the exact same thing. So, so yes? what quantum is that uh, on the Oracle in this theorem? Is it for any Oracle, or there exists an Oracle that uh, is a I mean, uh, do, do we need to find a specific oracle to, to match the, the usual so, assembly thing? Or if it's true for any oracle we can construct? Yeah, the, uh, the question is that what's the, the quantifier for the, uh, the oracle? Right. And the answer is that you just need to give me any oracle, give you the right distribution. Your algorithm still needs to work for that oracle. Okay. Yeah, so this oracle, the algorithm works for all oracles giving this, this distribution. And that's important. And if you have that, you say you have all the permutation, then you can somehow you know, do a random permutation before you do the, the real function, uh, the real algorithm using the Oracle. Then you can show you know, if you want to do that, and because we don't have any limitation on the size of uh, S, then you know, roughly it says you, it amounts to just do a random sample, uniform sample from S, and output this. So it's a cute argument. And, but it shows that it's a classical word there in the same thing. Okay, so then you know we we don't know how to you know get a quantum generalization for the sampling model, but for the Oracle model that that's easy. So you just say okay, we have a coherent just a query of this Oracle model. Now then it becomes possible we can do something you know better than classical and make use a coherent query. So that, so that's the model we use. Can I, can I backtrack one step? I'm, I'm thinking of applications of this. So sure. If you really have a source, you can push a button and draw a sample. Mm -hmm. Like I get a bunch of files, I'm going to compress them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. data. Can I, is it obvious how to construct such an oracle in such a, in such a case? You, you, you probably need to, you're saying, how can you construct this OP? Yes. From P? Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, that's first of all, S seems to kind of, there's a lot of freedom in there, I guess. Yeah, yeah, find. yeah. Is there like a, a canonical way, like a? Well, I mean, if you know the you know p and you know they're all rational numbers, then there should be some simple construction give you one you know possible oracle. I just don't know if you have other like a requirement like this need to be efficient or you know yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, that's a good question. I haven't <laughs> thought about it. Okay. <coughs> so yeah, this is a quantum oracle model. It's simple to see. Now. I want to just give you some like you know high level idea of how we are, you know do for you know give some quantum advantage. It turns out uh, we need to use different ideas for different range of uh, you know uh, you know alpha, and this is actually the same thing in the classical world as well. So 
And for different alpha, you know, the, the Renyi entropy the parameters, and, and when alpha is one is the channel entropy. So um, you can see uh, they're, they're, you know, they use a different idea, and there's some advantage and disadvantage. And it connects you in all kinds of different you know, stuff. So it might be interesting you know, because of this kind of connection. So um, the, f the first one will be uh, what, how I get uh, you know, quantum advantage for the, the parameter range for between a half and a two. And this is any alpha, not just the integer alpha. This is any alpha. So I think uh, you know, for this community, we already know amplitude amplification and phase estimation. So I need to uh, you know, talk about that. But there's a uh, to you know, more direct component we're going to use in the algorithm. So one is the uh, quantum speed up of the Chebyshev inequality. So the Chebyshev inequality here refers to the Chebyshev inequality for the concentration major, where you know the uh, the expectation, also you know the the variance, and you you just count how many copies you have. Uh, you know, just classically run and repeat multiple times. Uh, you can have a good error bound. So. It turns out there's a you know, quantum speed out for this kind of procedure. And this is work by Ashley Montanano. It gives a, like a quadratic speed up of a chip shift and quality in, con in concentration measure. So what's the setup? So the setup is that assume we have a uh, you know, quantum algorithm. The quantum algorithm, and of course, you, if you have a classical algorithm, you just need to make it reversible and it becomes a quantum algorithm. And all the puts a random variable x. And you know about the variance. And uh, it turns out you, if you can use like a you know big old theta of the the variance uh, square over the epsilon of uh, both the algorithm and the reverse of the algorithm, <coughs> then you can have a good estimate of ex of uh, its expectation with uh, let's say the the error will be epsilon and the chance will be a success chance will be uh, like three quarters. What is sigma here? Uh, Sigma is the standard variance. Yeah, S sigma here is standard variance. Epsilon is the error. So, so error epsilon, you know, basically says in, in, here is for the additive error. Here for the multiplicative error. So epsilon stands for the error, and the sigma stands for the standard variance. And uh, it, it, the the bound will be big tilde of uh, sigma over epsilon. So. The, uh, what you want to compare to is that uh, the classically, if you use the championship in quality, you need to use sigma square over epsilon square. But of course, there you don't have you don't need to use the inverse of a because it might not be reversible. <laughs> so, so, so that's the one of the tool we use. And the intuition behind you know doing this is uh, you know coming from the amplitude amplification. But I think this is a very nice uh, you know you know packaging of the techniques. Okay, so that's that's one tool we're going to use. Are there cases where A and A inverse could have significantly different costs? Uh, because of, because uh, here at least uh, we only con consider the query complexity. So, so uh, you, can, you can run it back or, or something, or is that too naive of a thinking? Uh, okay, you're 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 thinking. So I think usually you you know like the circuit for A, and is if it's quantum, they just run you know com you know reversely then the same cost. And this might be a case when uh, you you need to have you ha only have a classical A and make it reversible first, but still in that case the, maybe you can run uh, or you still need to have a reversible A and a, a inverse so this should probably still have the same complexity yeah 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 there shouldn't be too much well, difference because some functions classically they have a simple circuit. But the inverse has a very complicated circuit, right? Like a one-way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you there need to have competition assumption. But that, that's not a problem here. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we assume you, you can find the you know simple circuit for A, and it's a it's a reversible circuit, then it just to reverse itself. So maybe if you have a classical one-way function, finding the reversal of well, uh, computation of one-way function is hard. Yeah, but after you find it, reversal is easy. Yeah. Okay. Um, now the second tool. Second tool is actually more standard. It's just we use the quantum counting, and uh, so basically you imagine you have a specific uh, you know function you know from the uh, domain s to zero one, and you want to count the preimage of zero or zero or one. So the reason I, I you know this is just uh, if I open the black box to see what will be the output distribution for 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 like uh, for each possibility, 
And I opened this app uh, just because you know, later on we will show we do need to make use of this. We cannot use this, you know, um, the quantum counting as a black box so for the analysis. But for now, you can just forget about it. <coughs> and uh, 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 you know, particular trick we're going to use is that um, we, as I said, we want to find the estimation of this distribution. And then if I want to find distribution an I mean, estimation for pi, we can just directly use the quantum counting. We just uh, put everything other than i to be uh, 0, and everything is i to be 1. So if I count it, I only get uh, the, the number of uh, you know, parameters to the you know, particular output i, and I divide it by, the, I get an estimation of the pi. So that's the, the way we get it. OK, so, so that's the true uh, component. So what's the real algorithm? The real algorithm is uh, something like this. So we have a framework to estimate any, any like, uh, quantity that is uh, sigma, pi, and fpi. So fp can be any function. So any function from 0, zero 1 to a real number. And uh, so just to give you a sense, if the f uh, fx is uh, minus log x, this is general entropy. If it's uh, x to the r from minus 1, so this is the running entropy. So that's a unified framework. But for the NSS, you need to do a lot of different things. The framework is uh, unified. OK. So, so what are we going to do? So this is the, the outline of the algorithm. It's actually uh, quite intuitive. So what you do, we do is that we first go, you know, first, uh, uh, you know, this is what will be the this, this subroutine we use. And the, the meaning of a subroutine just to get the estimate of a pi and get the estimate, uh, then get the estimate of, of fpi. And then you randomly uh, pick uh, this i, you know, as the, the main, uh, uh, you know, algorithm. So the expectation of what you get from the subroutine will be just, uh, you know, recovery exactly this uh, uh, sigma i, pi, fpi. So the way we get the uh, uh, pi is that uh, you do the counting, quantum count, you know, counting to get uh, the pre image of i. So you have the uh, estimate of a pi. Then you just directly calculate uh, this f function based on that. And in terms of that together, you get the like, uh, pi of pi. And then you, you, you know, um, uh, because I randomly sample i from this distribution, uh, you can easily do that. Just classically, you can do that. You know, just uh, uniformly uh, put the uh, you know a uniform over s put it through the oracle function. So if you call this uh, subroutine multiple times, what you end up with will be the expectation of what you get a subroutine will be exactly fpi. And uh, then we make use of the quantum speed of the chip shifting quality. So you can split out, you know, you, if you don't use uh, this speed up, you probably need to use like a sigma square over epsilon square numbers of the subroutine. But because of speed up, you just need to use the sigma over epsilon. So that's a general framework. And you can see if I want to, you know, get a good uh, you know, bound for, you know, specific function of f, so there are a few things I need to do. So first I need to, you know, calculate what's the uh, expectation and calculate what's the variance. And, you know, from the, uh, those two things, I can also I need to calculate, uh, you know, um, you know, oh, sorry. So why I need to calculate uh, the expectation uh, other than just uh, intuitively think that's the right thing because uh, there are errors, you know, happen for, for each step. So when I say you, uh, think this is a quantum counting, you get a you know, PI, but this is not exactly this case. So there, there, there could be errors. So you need to calculate the expectation as well. But I mean, other than that, uh, you know, there's n nothing more you, you need to do. You have a question? Oh, OK. OK. So, um, so just to show a demonstrator with a um, specific uh, example, um, for the channel entropy, uh, we need to, uh, so this is again for the calculating the uh, expectation. And the reason we want to do that is that uh, we want to show at least the you know, expectation, the, uh, what you get from the subroutine, the, it matches the channel entropy. But um, because you could have error in your uh, estimation of a PI, and when you have PI very close to zero, uh, this log PI is very, very sensitive. So, so that's a uh, that's place we need to special uh, you know uh, you know attention, 
And uh, so the, the, the way we deal with that is, as I said, just to open the block box for quantum counting. You need to know what will be the tail bound for the errors. And you do a very, very thorough analysis. Then you can show, I mean, there's a way to bound the, the error for expectation. It's, uh, it's boring, it's not that interesting, but it's uh, you know, important. You need to have that to you know, ensure you have correctness. So, but you have the high level picture, I don't want to just uh, you know, bore you with this uh, detailed uh, calculation. So for channel entropy uh, estimation, uh, so this is the way specifically we choose the, uh, the parameter. And because the channel just choose the minus log, it's just follow the exactly the same framework. Uh, as I said, the calculation for expectation is actually non-trivial. So because of it can be you know error and uh, uh, this is very sensitive. And uh, there's a, another calculation that's important is the, to calculate the variance. So in turn, and for the variance, uh, it, turns, it turns out we need to again this is a, this might be standard in information theory, but uh, I'm not sure how. How you know how involved, how complicated this kind of technique is used in quantum setting, because uh, you can see here we have uh, you know errors in each PI. Then we want to use this approximate PI to uh, you know calculate the entropy. And all the errors can just uh, propagate it you know through all the steps. And uh, here you consider the variance. That's like second momentum. So it can be more complicated. Just imagine that. Um, so what I can tell you, um, the calculation take a few pages. Just to, to do that, uh, maybe on this slide, I just tell you the, the final result is you get something like this. You know, making use of the framework, making do the calculation, and it, you can get the square root of n over epsilon square. So that's the you know precise dependence on the epsilon. Okay, so that's for the channel entropy. Okay, um, the star for the running entropy at you know for this uh, parameter range is also similar. It's just getting more complicated, and in the calculation. But uh, uh, let me see whether I have uh, the specific. No, I don't even have that. Sorry. Uh, I should show you the the dependence. But this is. I think this is roughly the dependence you can see. This is uh, only have one over epsilon here for for uh, you know case alpha between one half and two, but not equals to one. Okay. So so that's the big framework for this range, uh, you know, parameter range, and this uh, this shows you some calculation sketch of this uh, idea. Now let's turn to another parameter range. As maybe just uh, you know, this is a follow a totally new, uh, you know, a totally different framework. So um, so the the this parameter range is the alpha is bigger than two as integer. As I said, I, we don't know how to do for the case alpha is bigger than two, not integer. But for the in the integer case, so why we have a solution? So this, the reason is that and this is also observed in the classical literature. Uh, when alpha is integer, we this problem could have a good uh, you know empirical estimator based on the alpha's frequency moment. So what's the frequency moment? Just imagine you have uh, a sequence of uh, you know uh, numbers coming from the you know support n, and you count the occurrence of the you know each one to n you know the number of those occurrence. Uh, called M1 to Mn, so the, the capital M and, and their different sin. So capital M can be much, much larger than N. So this is also a standard set of having the first the streaming algorithm. People want to consider the you know, frequency moments. So the frequency moments for, uh, you know, case frequency moments, which is Fk to be Mi to the K and sum over all possible I. Okay, so why this is uh, relevant? If we just use the empirical estimation for you know running entropy for any alpha, so we are actually calculating this. So sigma i of uh, you know summation of i pi to the alpha, and this is what this is just a, you know if I say this empirical estimation, just you know replace pi by the you know the frequent over the total number of m. So it's m i over m, and it just uh, you know you get m to the k out. So that's f k over m k. Oh, I'm sorry. I should I should I should use K here, <laughs> or you can you see this should be alpha here. Okay. So so basically, this uh, um, the ob observation says if I want to get integer you know running entropy for you know larger than two, it's actually I just need to calculate the you know the frequency moment, in some sense. So 
so you know what classically uh, people does for this kind of uh, you know empirical estimator is just random sample multiple copies. So you can think the complexity will be m, and you can use this uh, as your estimator. So you know after you say m, you can just count m1, m2, mn, and you know use this as your estimator of the the final solution. But again, I said this is not uh, the best classical estimator because uh, there are issues like uh, they're, they're not you know, mutually independent. You know, they, when you do the concentration of measure, you need to calculate the variance, then you have trouble there. But this roughly, uh, yes? This seems to also work when k is not an integer. So what, what is what Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. The, this formula also works when k is not integer. The, the reason why we, we need to have this uh, you know, constraint instead is we only know when k is integer how to calculate this efficiently. Ah, okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. But of course, th this is true for a k not being integer. And it's actually a good question. I, I don't know how to do for non integer k. Yeah. So, sorry, I just said, I'm just curious. So, this alpha, like, because the cases of different alphas are so different structurally to calculate, or it seems like it. How's it, so does it not measure different things then? I have no idea what the Rene entropy or not no feeling what it really does. Mm -hmm. like, I'm sorry, can you just... It seems so strange that alpha, for different alphas, like your calculations and your, your thoughts all have to be very different. Yeah. So that is not continuous. But isn't the Rene entropy to, supposed to measure something like a concept that's kind of like the same for different al alphas. So I think this is also, um, uh, the question is that why, I think this goes back to why we started different Rennie entropy, no, I, if the calculation is so different. No, 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 but is, it, is an integer Rennie entropy, so uh -huh. does it measure something somehow weirdly different from, a, for example, from a non-integer one or something? Or oh, okay, okay. Is this a... Um, you, you, so maybe I, let me give you a simple answer. If you say the Rennie entropy is 3 and 3.1, they actually measure something similar to each other. It's just uh, we are clever uh, enough to do the case for three. We are not clever enough to do 3.1. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I see. Well, the measuring is equivalent, but you can get bounds on the integer cases. You can't get the bound, same <coughs> bounds, same, same tricks you use. I think it's more about the, the algorithm we can do. It's like, uh, yeah. So it's the tools, not the physics. Yeah. It's, it's like we only have limited tools to deal with the integer case. Yeah. Okay. yeah and classically, you can do non integer case, and you see the picture. But just, uh, you know, we don't know how to get corner advantage over that. Okay, um, so so we want to basically use this empirical estimator in the now not in the sample model but in the query model. So uh, so there are certain you know a few issues, but I just want to highlight uh, two issues. So the first is that you cannot query them m times. So what do classically do? We just query them m times. I'm uh, sorry, sample m times and use the empirical you know estimator. If you do that, you you query completely still m. So there's no advantage. And how, how can you do that? It turns out there's a you know observation we have is that if you have the quantum oracle, so and you, you're not treating oracle as the way we define it, but just think the oracle is uh, just a sequence of a, s samples. S is, is the domain you have. And then uh, you calculate the alpha frequency of uh, this uh, you know the oracle applied to the one, you know, two until the size of the domain. It's exactly give you the s to the alpha times this. This is, in, in other words, it's another frequency moments, but not over, uh, you know, m, but it's over s. So s can be very, very large. But because s is not really the number of uh, queries you make, it's just the size of your, you know, uh, domain of your oracle function. Your capital S used to be a set. Uh, now it's what? Uh, s is the. Uh, I mean this. S is the, the, the domain of the Oracle function. So at, uh, we, I, I, think, I think this is consistent. So I only use S for the domain of, of the. Uh, oh, it's a, it, it's a uh, cardinality of S over there, right? Yeah. Where? The, the factor right before the sum should be a number, right? Yeah. Uh, and <coughs> you mean. This is cardinality. Oh, this is cardinality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, I see. I see. <laughs> yeah, this is cardinality. This is number. This is number. This is size. Size of the. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, if we can, you know, run the uh, you know alpha you know frequency uh, you know algorithm on our, our quantum oracle uh, you know 
uh, OP, then we can get this. And get this, and you almost get uh, you know this part because you know S. Now we can do that, and actually you can find a quantum speed up. Uh, this again, Ashley's work. I mean, Ashley has many good work uh, to calculate this alpha frequency moment, and with better than classical query complexity. And uh, so, just to give you ideas. So, classically, the best you can do to calculate the alpha frequency moment should be n to the one minus one over alpha. You can do, you know, small o of an, you know, three to the four one minus uh, one over alpha. So, this is not known to be the best, you know, what you can do in the quantum world, but still, it's already better than classical. And you know, why we can do that? It turns out we can have this kind of, you know, reduce the alpha frequency moment to the alpha distinctness problem. And we know for alpha distinctness problem, there's <coughs> a, at least the state of art, uh, you know, quantum algorithms by uh, Alexandra Belovs using the learning graph. And that's why you have this uh, small alpha, you know, n to the three quarters, because the, the real number is very, very com complicated. So I, I didn't you know, want to put this on the slides. But you see there, if you have uh, you know, improvement on this, then you have improvement on this complexity. We don't know whether that's this, uh, the best you can do at the moment. So there's a cache. The cache is that, uh, as I said, this S is your, you know, the cardinality of your, you know, you know, the domain of your Oracle function. So if you just think about that, so S should be the number of you have you know, sampled in, in the calculation of your frequency moment problems. So, so that basically says the input size n is not really n; it should be s. So it could, uh, you know, cause a trouble because then you compare with n. But if you using this approach, this part should be s. Now there's a simple solution to that. Uh, it turns out you just need to choose s to be uh, alpha n. So that would be sufficient to, you know, make everything go through for the NNSS. So alpha is, is constant here. So it's just, you know, this is roughly just n. But, but you see there, there, you can see there's a you know, conceptual gap. And this conceptual gap is somehow important when we consider now uh, uh, you know, any integer alpha n. So something uh, I probably mentioned at the end of this, my, my talk. But that's the idea. You can just choose S to be alpha n. Then you have uh, you know, quantum speed up for any uh, bigger than two integer alpha. OK. So uh, a brief, uh, you know, just a mention of uh, the lower bound we get. So we get a three set of lower bound, and that's, you know, continuously, uh, you know, you know, put them together, give you the, uh, the quantum lower bound of the entire parameter range. So how we get them? Uh, we use reductions. And uh, there are three reductions we make use of. Uh, so the so first one is that if uh, there's a result by Aronson and Abanis, to say um, there should be some polynomial relation between uh, quantum and the classical uh, complexity if you want to study the function where if you run in parameter to your uh, input, the result does not change. So, and that's the way we get this uh, lower bound. Because we know the classical uh, lower bound, then we know, uh, you know the, uh, the quantum lower bound. And uh, the second one coming from the collision, and it's not really hard to, to, to embed a collision into this, uh, this problem. Because you have different collision, then you can see the entropy can differ by at least the constant amount. The third one is by having weight uh, problems. Just, um, I, I, I think this is like a, uh, you know, refined version of a collision in some sense. So it gets give you a you know good amount for you know large uh, parameter range. So that's uh, just a, you know overview of what I get for the lower bound. Okay, so yeah, I still have a few minutes. I, I want to talk really talk about this. So open questions and uh, ongoing work. So. I think this is the uh, the message I want to send. Uh, you see, we have uh, some quantum speed up for different you know parameter range of uh, alpha, and I uh, actually I you know I keep asking you know myself this question. So why is this uh, you know current work? You know, is this the right work? You know, in the framework, uh, I actually say it's not that satisfactory. You see, the picture is it's not uh, you know it's, it's it's complicated i should say you only, you need to have a piecewise solution for the you know whole you know parameter range can you do better than that and um, so we don't know whether uh, you know you can use the other alternative at the moment and we are not satisfied with the current framework but that's the best thing we can show at the moment and we do know uh, if there's some natural attempts that do not work 
thing. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I'm very unfortunate. This is the only thing we found that works. That's not satisfactory. And if you have, uh, you know, you know, thoughts or you know, ideas, we can talk about it. I said this is still ongoing. So maybe if you ask me the question, same question in three weeks, I maybe change my mind. So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so of course, what do we want to do? We want to do this for any alpha this in, the, in the whole parameter range, not just the integer. We have some solution for this. As I said again, uh, you can, you can you know, use this uh, solution and, uh, you know, just uh, for any alpha. You just don't have any quantum advantage when alpha is bigger than two. So, but we do have the classical result in that you know range. So maybe you can, uh, you know, just make clever you know, uh, you know, a, a quantum algorithm for that parameter range. That's possible. So th there's something uh, you know concrete I can say as a, an ongoing work. So we do uh, you know think about the case when alpha is an infinity. So what I mean by alpha is infinity? The Rennie infinity norm is also called the mean entropy. So mean entropy. Basically, what you want to do is find the maximum probability, maximum of the pi. So, and this is a going to say if you have, a, you know, um, a, a sequence of items, you want to find the one that occur, occurs the most, you know, time. So classically, again, this is interesting. You have n over log n. So this is not really uh, studied in the literature, but it's not that hard if you follow the Valent Brothers theorem and do the calculation for this particular case. You can get this result. And we can have a uh, square root of uh, n quantum lower bound. That's that's what something we we knew, and uh, we all can, we can also connect this problem to the alpha distinctness problem, similar to what we have done for the you know the integer alpha case. But now for this you know the in, in the main entropy, you need to have a super constant alpha. So super constant alpha distinctness problem is actually a total open question for even you know for quantum. And we know classically what how you can do that. And why why I say it's a totally unknown because um, so there are only two uh, results for the alpha distinctness problem I mean, and the upper bound you can see the very original the, the algorithm by Abanis, the the state of art like as mentioned by the Alexandro Belovs. And if you um, put super constant alpha into their framework, you don't get any other advantage. They only work for constant alpha. I mean, uh, at least for Blaus, the only for constant alpha for a balance work you can get for like uh, a square root of a log n. You can, you can still have an uh, advantage, but go beyond that, you don't have an advantage. So we need like a log n distinctness. So if we directly apply that, there's no advantage. Yes? Sorry, stupid question. What's a super constant? Super constant is anything bigger than constant. It's like, uh, you know, have dependence on n. Yeah. So you allow alpha to It's uh, maybe I should say super polynomial. Then you see it's a super polynomial. Now just say super constant. Yeah. Have you know any dependence and that's super constant. Okay. So I think this question by itself is interesting. I you know, given the distinctness problem is important, and this is just a start a you know different parameter range. What do we can do? Uh, we we don't know the result at the moment, but I think that's definitely uh, some. Question in interest on its own right, and there's one more thing I want to mention that uh, so so far all the lower bounds are obtained by reductions. So and the reduction from the hard boolean function problems, but this problem is actually just about distributions. Can we have direct uh, you know you know develop tools to directly handle this case? Maybe we can have a polynomial method for distributions, not for just uh, boolean functions. And then you can hope to prove better lower bound. As, as you said, there's a, you know our lower bound is going to be, you know, there's a gap between what you can do classically. But, but maybe that's because we're we're not good at proving lower bound for this type of questions. So, yeah, this I, I said this is you know, just to reflect my you know very initial purpose. And we uh, my start is the problem that can in call for new techniques. I think this is a uh, you know a concrete point that needs a new type of techniques. And that's it. Thank you. We already have a lot of questions. Yes? So I think you mentioned initially that there's a difference between the Oracle model and the Sample model. Yeah. You talked about the Oracle model, right? Yeah, so, so it's like uh, the relation should, should be said in this way. So uh, in the classical world, uh, Oracle model and the class, uh, sample model, they're somehow equivalent. And when you extend it to, to quantum, we can only show 
uh, a quantum advantage in the Oracle model because there's a simple extension can allow a coherent query of, uh, you know, a coherent access of the information of distribution in the query. We don't know any the sample model? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, to be fair, I mean. I mean, there, we can, the most naive approach might be think about some CGM on the sample model. Yeah. By dividing the entropy real uh, line into some segments. But I think the, the issue is that if you think about the sample model, then you, you have a lot of uh, distribution that's like diagonal density operator tensor. So the question is that how can you do that? And you want to use quantum. Right. So because everything is diagonalized, then in the, if you want to find quantum advantage, you might think I need to have something at least in superposition. But where you can have superposition, that, that's the question. I, 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 don't, I don't really have a good idea to see how can you make use of uh, you know, the diagonal matrix and again make a superposition. But, but that's a good question. I mean, definitely I want to see whether it's possible you can you just you get some other advantage in the sample model. But I don't have a good idea at the moment. And, uh, have, you had, have you read any comments from other papers why people don't consider sample cases? Uh, I, I, I haven't got comments on that. I guess, uh, I mean, there, there are actually not many literature already. and. I, one reason, I guess, is like I, I actually I tried the sample model first, so I mean I cannot put the things I tried and failed in my slides, but I can tell you uh, I tried that I tried that like for one or two months. I even tried to think whether I can use the you know the exponential uh, density operator method. I think that's like in a very beautiful technique. Um, then in you know, all the things I I know I tried and don't see any other advantage because I think. Um, the, the reason is that uh, what, whatever you do is that uh, you don't really make use of quantum I, if you only start with the you know, diagonal. Yeah. It's, it seems that you can always just you know, use a classical way to simulate what you do in the quantum. And then you say there shouldn't be any advantage because you're just doing classical. I have uh, another question. Like at the very end, you mentioned in the open problems that basically the lower bounds are obtained by reductions to, to known other problems. Yeah. Have you tried to apply the like adversary method to that specific problem? Like, I, I understand I, it's a sampling problem, so it's yeah, not yeah. So to that that's a good question. So, so applying adversary method is on our schedule for next week. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we do apply the polynomial method. Okay. So I can tell you a little bit. Um, so I, I mentioned um, this this lower bound, square root of n for mean entropy. So that's a by reduction. And it's not satisfactory. But you can see that the upper bound is n over log n. So it's also hard to see you can get a, a you know, bound for n over log n you know, from you know, the normal way you prove lower bounds. So, so, um, so what we do is that we say, how about we just directly look into the polynomial generated and just think about a worst case for the mean entropy and to see what will be the degree bound you can get from it. And, and it turn, turns out, this, uh, in order to do that, you need to use the, the, the lower bound you know, for the collision, you know, the techniques there to think how you can, okay. because for multivariable polynomials, we don't know a lot of techniques to deal with that. Right. So you want to have some way to make it, you know, symmetrized sense to become a single variable. Mm -hmm. And if we just use that technique alone, that's not doing anything <laughs> better than the square root of n. But it could, could, I mean, it could because just we are not clever enough. So, yeah, it's similar to, to collision. Uh, I should say the techniques, techniques-wise, you know, similar. Yeah, and you can, you can, you know, just be clever constructing some, you know, polynomials. Sounds good. Yeah. I think we should wrap it up. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, thank Charlie again. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you.